it's official. Come on in, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> How are you? It's good to see you. Happy Monday, everyone. I am glad today we are talking about stress, coping, and resilience on a Monday. That seems, seems topical. Clay, so I'm excited about that. Uh, let's see here. As you join, go ahead and uh, Ryan says, hi, happy Monday. Uh, as you join, drop into the chat who you are, where you're coming from. I'm going to make it so that all of you can chat with all of us. So drop your uh, where you're coming from. Um, John says, go Dr. Clayton Cook, uh, where you're coming in from today. And we were talking about this right before uh, we went live. So I'm interested in the chat. How would you distinguish stress and anxiety? Stress and anxiety, what do those two things mean to you uh, in the chat? Even if you give like one word definitions, stress versus anxiety. We're talking about that a little bit today. We're gonna dig in. Dr. Cook here today, gonna give us all kinds of thoughtful context and strategies to manage the stressful reality we live inside of. Uh, we're live on Facebook here. We're live on Zoom. This is fun. Clay, I'm so glad to see you again. We hung out this weekend at the Empathy Implementation and Equity Conference. Dr. K Cook came in from his lawnmower to present. He came in uh, because we had a presenter whose power went out. Talk about stress on my end. <laughs> and Dr. Cook came in to alleviate that stress. What a gift. Oh, it was an awesome event too. That's the best when you can just kick back and learn and when yeah. you're part of something. No, that's, that's rare for us. We typically like, we think we need to do the, be the ones given all the content. This weekend we're like, wait, there's a lot of people who are a lot smarter than us and a lot of things. Yeah. Well, we should make sure we give them a microphone. <laughs> uh, Richard said stress is too much in too little time. Anxiety is the anticipation of fear or that things will go wrong. Interesting like that. Someone says stress and anxiety equals my life. So not a distinction between the two, just sort of identifying with them. Well, I'm glad you're here today, Aaron. Hopefully we can talk about some of those things and alleviate that a little bit. We got Bellingham, Washington in the building. We got California. We got Houston, Texas. Addie's here from Wrangell, Alaska. That's killer. We don't get to see uh, Alaska here all that often. Bellman Wrangell. Prep. Yeah, Wrangell, Alaska. That's a good name. Uh, we got some Amos Washington, Martha, Martha D, one of our Character Strong webinar and event legends. And Postalweight. Hi, Ann. Coming in from Northern Minnesota. I don't know if you know Ann, Dr. Cook, but Ann runs the National uh, Student Council Organization. And she's in your neck of the woods. But she's in Northern. And so I she need might to be connect. In. You do need to connect, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's happening now, even just over text. Uh, but I will make that more formal connection here soon, Anne and Clay. Uh, we got Wisconsin here in the building, your neighbor. Uh, New York is here, Warwick Valley, which is awesome. All kinds of Missouri's in the building. Phoenix is here. Massachusetts is here. We got a squad, Clay. I say we get rolling. I know John is here, my co-founder in the background, ready to be chatting and listening in. Uh, so excited and thrilled to have you once again, uh, Dr. Cook, um, a friend, a legend. Um, the University of Minnesota has informed so much of the way that we think about the implementation of our work. Uh, and as he presented this weekend at our conference, I think, uh, Clay, your greatest gift is uh, taking the practice and the art, meeting it with science, and how do we bridge that gap? You talked about that. And I feel like you've lived that. You've, you've been an implementer yourself and you think about implementation at the high level. Um, so super excited to have you here today talking about stress coping and resilience, uh, sort of encapsulating the things that we need to be thinking about as we start a brand new year in the context of a lot of stress. And even people in the chat saying stress and anxiety equals my life right now. So what can we do to, to talk through that and equip people with the skills that we need to navigate this time successfully? Clay, I'm tossing this to you. Awesome. Thanks, Houston. You know, my background training was as originally a paraprofessional, then I was a middle school math teacher, and then I was trained as a psychologist. Um, I'm a licensed psychologist. The way I look at things is through particular paradigms. 
uh, that I was trained in that lead to effective treatment. So we understand that how people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors manifest. There's things we can do to manage our thoughts. There's things we can do to better regulate our emotions. And there's certain behaviors we can engage in with others to help create an environment that promotes us to be as healthy as possible. I started getting into, interested in this topic as a researcher because stress and burnout um, interferes with all kinds of good things we want. And there uh, was a general lack of attention to the adults on how well they're doing uh, as it relates to promoting meaningful outcomes for students. And as soon as we start to, you know, emphasize the role of the adults in kids' lives, we start, need to start asking questions like, how well are you? What does it mean to be well? If we are well, what does that do for our, our performance and our own development and growth over time? And so that's what led us to really start to understand adult well-being and better understand things like stress coping and resilience. Now for student outcomes to change, we need adults to change because the adults help create more meaningful and enriched experiences. So fundamentally, if we want student outcomes to change, we have to think about what are the changes the adults can make in the environments in which the students are situated. And those changes need to be meaningful and enriched experiences that enable students to be well, to perform well and to develop and grow over time. The issue is if adults are struggling socially and emotionally, they're gonna have difficulties creating those enriched experiences and they may unintentionally engage in behaviors that ultimately are not aligned with their values. So adults are capable, if we can't regulate ourselves in the moment when students say and do things that we disagree with or that bug or irritate us, we may end up engaging in unskillful interactions that make situations worse for the kid. And that is, does not align with any educator's values. So we have to fundamentally situate social emotional well-being of the adults as central to the whole educational enterprise. It should be part of our nation's agenda to achieve meaningful outcome changes. Schools should have common language and dedicated practice that focus on cultivating and nurturing the adults to be as well as possible in their roles to support the outcomes for students. Because when we think about it, what we're trying to do, when we think about educator well-being and performance, we're adopting a parallel process we're trying to create for students. We need to create healthy working conditions in the environment. Sometimes we're asking people to engage in self-care, but the environment is the problem. It could be a toxic environment. It's an environment where the relationships uh, are, there's no sense of trust that's been established among people. People are overwhelmed. We call it implementation overload. And so the environment is causing the stress. So we need to create healthy working conditions and environment. But the other piece here is the self-care piece. So if I'm in a healthy working condition and environment, I also need to acquire and apply my own well-being promoting practices. And these things interact with one another. We are all embedded within environments to the extent that the environment we work within is healthy, supportive, and I feel like a, a valued, respected member of that place, that's gonna be promotive of my well being. But work is not gonna be without stress and adversity. Those two things are inherent in the profession of education and arguably inherent in any meaningful career. So we also have to have the self care to be able to manage the stress and adversity that's inherent in the job because people can be in healthy environments and working conditions, but still their stress and the adversity can get the best of them and take, produce a wear and tear on their mind, bodies, and behavior, and ultimately undermine their performance and their role. So I wanna first talk about the, the idea of working conditions and learning conditions. So this is one piece to the puzzle. We have, working conditions for the adults and learning conditions for the students. And what you'll see here is the same thing that students need in terms of healthy learning conditions. They need to feel like a valued, respected member of a place. They need to have balanced 
and manageable expectations for work. They need to have supportive teachers and they need to be provided with the resources and supports that enable them to be successful. The same is true of educators. People need to feel like a valued, respected member of that school. We have a National Institute of Justice grant where we're looking at the prevention of violence, like massive violence on campuses. And the number one root cause that we've pinpointed that should be the focus of interventions to create school safety and prevent mass violence is sense of belonging. Now, if you can in the chat function, why is that so critical? And I want you to imagine now, because we often uh, put that perspective uh, on students, but what if we apply it to educators? Why is sense of belonging critical? And if a person doesn't feel like they belong, they don't feel like they're a valued, respected member of a school, how might that manifest in terms of their behavior? What would we see? Burnout, sadness, isolation, not caring about performance. Ryan says this is huge, builds empathy and helps students understand how their actions affect others, decrease of job performance, ostracized teachers, loss of interest, non-engagement, exhaustion, frustration, anger, lack of passion, anxiety seems to be the consistent theme. What it does, because we're all biological creatures, it produces a physiological response that's going to cause people to either fight or flight. And so that's where, when it boils down, our environments can trigger our nervous system and we feel it really energized to do certain things. And that could be to walk away and disengage. And we're really motivated to do those to avoid certain circumstances, or it could cause us to want to act out and attack and defend. And so we know that at the root cause for why people say and do their, uh, what, uh, do things that others might perceive as problematic is often at the core of it could be lack of sense of belonging. So we need to create environments where everybody feels like a valued, respected member of that place. We got to make sure people have balanced, manageable work demands. They have supportive leadership who they can go to, who understand them and accept them for who they are. And they're provided with the resources and supports to be successful in their role. Take a multi-tiered framework. Now, many people think it's a way we organize and deliver services to kids based on need. I look at a multi-tiered framework as a way of organizing and delivering supports for any human. And so we can apply a multi-tiered perspective to teachers. What, are, what do all teachers need? What are some teachers are gonna need? And what a few of our teachers gonna need? And how do we begin to organize the supports and make them available based on need? You can use a multi-tiered perspective for families. What are we gonna do for all families? What are we gonna have to do for some of our families? And what are we gonna have to do for a few of our families? So when we think about supporting the adults, we have to recognize that not everybody's gonna have the same level of need and how do we build in supports based on what people need in terms of professional development, to be able to manage certain situations, and we're accepting people for who they are. Prioritize and protect time is another part of the environment. People are gonna get really, really stressed out if they feel pressure to do something and there's not protected time. So really to not overwhelm the adults, we have to create a process of prioritizing, prioritizing a manageable, feasible subset of work that we think that there's humans on the planet that can actually do it. In many organizations, I've gone in and there's been over 100 active implementation initiatives that have implications for behaviors that adults have to engage in. Now, if you go into those environments, people are really stressed and burned out. There's high turnover intentions and people are bailing out of the system and the environment's creating that because they're not prioritizing a manageable, feasible subset of work. And then once you've prioritized something, because priorities say what we're gonna talk about, what we're gonna create expectations around. You gotta protect time for people to actually do the things that are expected of them. So they can plan, they can reflect, they can collaborate with others to get better at it, to continuously improve as time goes on. So this idea of implementation overload is a biggie. 
can a person do everything that they're expected to do that's being put on their plate? Now, there's some essentials that we can never remove off the plate, like building relationships with kids and making sure that they feel connected. But if we start to overload someone, that's when we see burnout, stress, turnover intentions go up. So this is really a leadership issue of both formal and informal leaders working together to make sure that we have ambitious yet manageable workloads in terms of the prioritized work that we're gonna be putting on people's plates, creating expectations around, sharing resources about, measuring and giving them feedback about. Many systems are overloaded with implementation. So when we say like what should go on teacher's plates, for example, we need to have a portion control. We gotta make sure we don't put too much. And then we gotta get the right stuff on the plate. A lot of times what we're putting on people's plates, there's no value add. There is no evidence you'll move the needle on kid outcomes if you put that on the adult's plate. And we have all kinds of examples of certain priorities that seem really important in school, but it's not gonna move the needle on any type of outcome. So we gotta make sure that we have a good portion control and we have the right stuff on the plate. Because what works for students, I just wanna run through a couple of scenarios. Imagine students in an environment like this. The teacher prioritizes what to focus on to avoid overwhelming the students. Teacher makes students feel like a valued, respected member of the classroom. Teacher allocates time and attention to teach and revisit expectations regarding behavior. Teacher models the expected behavior themselves. Teacher monitors and gives students feedback about the behavior. Teacher builds trusting relationships and encourages the behavior. Teacher recognizes and acknowledges behavior to show appreciation to students for exhibiting them. Teacher responds consistently, calmly, and with empathy when students struggle with the behavior. Now, when we transition over to the adults, leadership prioritizes the work to avoid overwhelming staff. Because imagine states, push priorities down to districts. District leaders who are effective filter all those and make the work manageable, transparent, and doable. Site leaders sometimes within districts have to filter for their staff and that's a really important leadership choice. And no single person should own the responsibility to do that. That's why distributed leadership structures with formal and informal leaders really uh, thinking about everything that's being pushed down on their school, what are the priorities so we can make it manageable and feasible for our staff to be able to take on. Because if we overwhelm the adults, everything will be thinly implemented and students won't, won't benefit from anything we're doing. So if we continue down this line, leadership allocates time and attention to teach and revisit expectations about a thing. A thing is something to implement. Leadership models the thing. Leadership monitors and gives feedback about the thing. Leadership builds trusting relationships and encourages people to do the thing. Leadership sp uh, spends time recognizing and re rewarding staff for the energy and effort they put into doing the thing. And last, if staff struggle, leadership consistently, calmly, and with empathy reacts to when people struggle to do the thing. So those are the types of healthy environments that promote someone to, it minimizes stress inducing experiences, promotes people's well-being because they feel like a valued part of the place and it optimizes their performance. So they're more likely to achieve certain types of outcomes that are meaningful. Another characteristic of the environment is whether it's psychologically safe. And this literature, this scientific research base is super fascinating. High performing places really are psychologically safe environment because it's the belief that one will not be punished, negatively judged or humiliated when they speak up about something that's not working. They're vulnerable about what they need because they're struggling or if they talk about a mistake or a mishap that they had. So then how can a system get better if people can't speak up, people can't be vulnerable about their needs in terms of they're not being met or if they're making mistakes. So psychological safety is this trust and it's critical to facilitate collaboration, build healthy relationships and create a productive work environment. Now the question is how do we create a psychologically safe context? I go into many buildings and you realize at the outset 
that the adult relationships aren't in a place to enable the work to really take effect because there's clicks, uh, there's infighting, there's uh, us versus them mentality in the building. And you realize all that's gonna have a trickle down effect on the students, but it's also producing a wear and tear on the adults well-being and functioning in that place. So there's a few things. Making it a culture of openness to feedback. And one of the best ways is to what we call is create two-way feedback loops. Not only does feedback go down to staff about how they're doing or then staff to students, no, it can go up and down because everybody's open to getting feedback and we create methods to give people feedback about what's working and not working. And that becomes a norm and it's not viewed in an evaluative lens where people are trying to catch people as being ineffective or rotten at what they're doing. Intentionally create opportunities for healthy relationships. Actually create activities. Houston and John and the Character Strong crew have done an awesome job for staff, adult, like staff character dares, but also just kind of micro activities that are relationship building alone that you could just do tomorrow if you really wanted to, to create opportunities for staff to get to one, know one another and create that context for trust to occur. Giving people the uh, podium to exhibit humility and admit fallibility that one of the biggest ways people can create a psychologically safe environment is to take ownership for the mistakes that are being made. If you wanna create a psychologically safe environment for students, for example, we've done all kinds of focus groups with high school kids and the number one they, thing they love an adult to do in their life to make them feel connected is an adult doesn't act holier than thou and actually takes ownership for all the mistakes they're making. I mean, they. They feed on it. They love it. They love to hear that the adult doesn't think they're, you know, incapable of making a mistake. They love to hear someone fess up to something that's not working or could have been handled better because now you can get out that out in the open and you can work on a plan to course correct. Providing people with voice and input opportunities are additional ways to create a psychologically safe environment. So what else comes to mind? If you're going to think, okay, we got to, I get it, psychologically safe environments are healthy for the adults because there's trusting relationships. People don't fear being negatively judged or punished or ridiculed for making mistakes. That's awesome, I want that. What else comes to mind in terms of if you were gonna to try to intentionally engineer it, what are ways you can create a psychologically safe environment and be intentional about getting it in place versus passively hoping that the psychological safety will emerge kind of on its own. So if you can use the chat function, I'd love to hear what others thoughts are around how you could promote this type of relational context for the adults to exist within. Get to know in staff preference for receiving critical feedback and praise public versus private. I love that. Oh yeah. It's a bit of like the love languages, but feedback languages is just as important. Schedule time to do activities that the staff enjoys doing together. I love seeing schools, especially who are implementing character strong role model, what it looks like to do the lessons, right? Because if we can make them interesting for the adults and showcase what they look like, a lot of times the goal of those are community building oriented. So why, should, why would we not role model those with our staff to A, build that community and then B, further equip people to implement effectively opportunities for community service school wide. Yeah. Ask for help from students. I love that. I heard this cool idea, Clay, uh, back in March from a teacher who had their students came in at the beginning of staff meetings and read that week's staff character dare to the staff. So for context, uh, we have these things character strong called character dares for students, but we also built some for staff. We have them for administrators and for families. They're basically practical ways to put our character into action. Um, things like at, at times admitting fallibility and exercising humility. And I love the fact that students are challenging adults to put it into action. Good opportunities for fun. Listen, 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 and know <laughs> your staff stories. Show appreciation for hard work. Create systems to show that appreciation I think is a big deal. Good stuff. 
Yeah, there's a lot that can be intentionally done. So it's this important in terms of the health of the environment for the adults that a leadership team within the building should be developing plans on what are we going to do to continuously improve our environment so it's psychological, it's characterized as psychologically safe by the staff. Because that is going to be an enabler that helps our school turn into a learning organization where we can actually speak truth and not feel negatively judged so we can get out in the open things that aren't working so we can develop plans to continuously improve because we now trust one another. We are open and willing to collaborate with one another to get better as a group. Low self-efficacy isn't good for adults. They exist in an environment where they're put in positions to and, and experience pressure to assert, achieve certain outcomes, but people aren't feeling efficacious in their ability to meet the needs that are in front of them. So when people do not feel efficacious, they tend to start to lose hope, they lose confidence in their capability to produce in a desired effect. So the way we think about a healthy environment for the adults is continuous examination of areas where staff are feeling low self-efficacy and then mobilizing, boosting self-efficacy by mobilizing targeted professional development that really starts to support teachers or staff to acquire knowledge and skills to address certain identified areas of need. So PD, really good PD that's responsive to what the adults are saying. Too often what we find is the staff are saying, hey, these are our needs because we're struggling in these areas, but the PD plan doesn't mirror what the people say they're struggling with. And so people continue to have a low sense of efficacy because they look into their bag of tricks or they're looking for techniques and strategies and they're not recognizing or aware of the things that they have under their control to meet particular needs of students. So when you think about it, here's some biggies that we know drive and increase stress and burnout. When people lack skills in these areas, their stress and burnout is higher. Proactively managing, and I would even say motivating and responding to student behavior. When people feel like they don't have the skills or knowledge to be able to manage student behavior, motivate students to do things that they're not feeling motivated to do or respond effectively to uh, behaviors that are interfering with learning, they start to uh, experience low efficacy and it increases stress and burnout. One thing looking into this brave new academic world we're confronted with uh, in terms of distance learning and maybe being on a yo-yo going from distance to in-person, hybrid or some combination there is being able to maintain healthy social connections with kids. A lot of people, educators are worrying about their ability to maintain, uh, build and maintain healthy social connections with kids in distance learning. So providing targeted professional development so people understand the things that are under their control to build and maintain healthy social connections with kids can boost sense of efficacy. And all of a sudden, things don't appear as stressful. People have more energy and vitality they bring to the work. Differentiated supports for students who struggle. I got these kids in my class who the base supports that I typically do for all kids aren't working. And many people don't have methods they've received training and support in and how to differentiate supports for students who are struggling. And so that target of PD is really how we boost sense of efficacy because lack of efficacy is I don't think I have control over the factors to meet the needs of the students. Really good PD helps people recognize the things that are under their control to actually address the needs and produce the outcomes that they're feeling some degree of pressure uh, to produce. So I want to turn now to some ideas around stress and adversity and get more to the self-care piece. There needs to be a recognition that stress and adversity, you can't get out of life without them. There's a reason why we have them. I often like to think, you know, we have eyeballs for seeing, ears to listen with, you know, hands to grab things with, feet to stand on. Why do we have stress? 
What function does it serve us? Why, if we go to anywhere on this planet and you ask someone, they got it. We all have it. So what function does it serve? When does it become a little too much? And we need to do something about it. So stress is inevitable. And then everyone is gonna experience adversity and challenge in their life. Some people are experiencing way more. And for really wrong reasons, like historical oppression, um, discrimination, continuation of systemic racism. Those are adversities people, some subgroups in our country experience way more of it. And it's not just about self-care, it's about changing the environment. So I don't want people to mishear me on the self-care piece because if the environment is unhealthy, we have to change the environment. But within a healthy environment, people can still benefit from learning the skills and strategies to be able to manage themselves within their current situations. And that's what I think ultimately the self-care movement's about. So you probably remember in eighth grade, we had a, a topic or a concept called homeostasis. Really when you're in a homeostatic balance, you have an ideal uh, heart rate, you have an ideal uh, temperature, ideal glucose, basically an ideal everything. Now a stressor is something that knocks us out of homeostatic balance. And we often refer to that as like residing in the autonomic nervous system. So the parasympathetic is your kind of cool, calm and collected. The relaxation response, a stressor comes, now you're knocked out of that and now you're into the sympathetic. So your body starts to mobilize to want to do something because emotions essentially have motivational properties. They make us feel compelled to do something. Withdraw, disengage, run away from, escape, avoid, or act out, challenge, confront, attack, defend. So when a stressor happens, usually what happens to our attention, our attention narrows, and we start to focus on the thing that's stressing us out, and our behavior thus narrows. And you could think for survival purposes back in the day, that had a lot of value, and it suited us well. But nowadays, our stress response gets activated and it can start to cause us to want to fight or flight in situations where those behaviors are not justified nor proportional to the situation. So why don't zebras get ulcers? You can in the chat function, why don't they get ulcers? And so I'll imagine we're all zebra on the Serengeti plane, we're grazing. And then a stressor comes into our life. We're in, we have homeostatic balance because we're in an ideal state, we're grazing, but then a lion comes. That's our stressor. It knocks us out of homeostatic balance. We end up fleeing and we get away. Soon as, not long after the lion goes, we'll actually return back to grazing. There won't have an elevated chronic stress response that can last weeks. So what, what's different with humans? Why don't zebras get ulcers and why do humans do? This is where the difference here is where we have to develop strategies, techniques, and coping mechanisms to be able to manage our stress because our stress can elevate and escalate and be chronic and that's what starts to really produce a wear and tear in our minds, bodies, and behaviors. Not the fact that we initially experience stress, because stress can be a, a cue to us to act in certain ways. But if it stays elevated and chronic, that's when it starts to really produce a wear and tear in our mind, bodies, and behaviors. So if you put something in the chat function, maybe you put something about ruminating. So ruminating means the stressor has happened, but you stay fixated on it and you perseverate on it. And that's why we can continue to have an elevated stress response because we continue to think about the thing that happened. So we continue to think about the lion and we stay elevated in terms of our activated stress response. Anticipatory stress. I know many of you have, uh, have done this just thinking about this new academic year. You're anticipating things that could go wrong and happen and you're already activating your stress response. Anticipatory stress could be helpful in some ways, but if 
we find ourselves in a, uh, a chronic state of anticipatory stress, that's when it produces wear and tear on our minds, bodies, and behaviors. And we're feeling fatigued. We just kind of avoid certain work because we just are not in a position to do it. And then we can confront real stressors in the moment. So one reason why we get ulcers is because we have different dimensions of experiencing stress, rumination, anticipation, and facing it. And that's what that good old prefrontal cortex does for us relative to other animals is we can ruminate, we can forecast and anticipate things that are gonna happen. And then obviously we, we experience real stressors in the moment. So chronic unremitting stress. If I wanted to, I can have you all mail me a hair sample. We have uh, devices where we can, I could assess what's called your allostatic load. That would tell me how much your body is working to ward off stress. High allostatic load means you have chronic unremitting stress. And typically high allostatic load, you're gonna feel it in your body. And there's no medical explanation for it. You're gonna feel it in your mind and it may manifest in, your, in terms of your behavior. So this is where we need to understand the difference between good stress that actually mobilizes and energizes our performance and our behavior. And we don't wanna look at stress as being inherently bad. What we need to do is recognize when stress is sticking with us too long or it's too intense and it could start producing a wear and tear on our mind, bodies, and behaviors. Because how you orient to stress, if stress is something to be completely avoided, then anytime I experience it, I want to get rid of it. And that has a paradoxical effect of exacerbating the stress response. Have you ever had someone tell you, hey, don't think about the, what you're stressing about? Don't think about it. And that's a paradoxical effect. The more you try not to think about something, you'll think about it. And that's the worst suggestion you can ever make. Like if I said, don't think about an uh, elephant in a pink tutu dress dancing around, and I said, don't think about that elephant, just don't think about it, the more you're gonna think about it. So that's how stress can get the best of us. Many of you have seen this, it's called the, the Yerkes Dotson Curve. No stress actually isn't good for our performance. We underperform because if there's actually no activated stress response, there's nothing on the line, motivation is super low and performance is low. But then there's this like moderate manageable levels of stress that allow people to focus better, they perform better, they problem solve better. But then we got this other tail here. And this is when stress becomes overwhelming and unmanageable and people start to really get impacted and it undermines their well-being and performance. So our goal isn't to avoid stress. Our goal is to recognize stress as helpful but there's also situations in which we need to develop skill strategies and methods to be able to manage the intensity of the stress so it doesn't produce a wear and tear in our minds, bodies, and behavior. Because you really can't get a meaningful life without experiencing stress. Just think about it. All the meaningful things in life come along with stress. Like even if you want like a really cool vacation experience, did you have to experience stress to be able to access that? If you're a parent, professions that have meaningful and they're purpose-driven and values-aligned profession, can you have those without stress? So the goal isn't to avoid stress, it's to actually plug into purposeful, meaningful pursuits in life and develop the skills and strategies to manage the stress that comes along with doing those meaningful and purposeful things. So I want you to just share, if you feel comfortable, what is something that is bringing you both stress and value to your life right now? So we can see that these things are paired. Things that have value tend to be coupled with stress. So if you can go ahead and share in the chat function. What is bringing you both stress and value? Family, career, college age kids navigating the next step, kind of releasing them out into adult world. 
single parenting. Lots of things. Faith for those that have a faith. Lots of things. So our goal is to really orient to the notion of stress that it's not bad. It's not meant to be avoided and eradicated. Stress that is <laughs> the bad type is stress that's too intense and it overwhelms us and it's chronic and unremitting and it's not going away. So this is the paradigm for life. I really do. We've all gone through this and I feel a little bit embarrassed to put it here because many people say, you know, the, the airplane example, put the mask on yourself first before you can act in the service of others, but it's, it's true. And we call it acting from the inside out. If we care for ourselves to get ourselves in the best place, mentally, physiologically, and emotionally, I'm going to be way better in my care and my service to others. So this notion of servant leadership that's fundamental and character strong is dependent on how well you are. We're going to be less effective in the service of others to the extent that we're unwell. And so it's not selfish. It's not vanity. It's professional effectiveness. And it's aligned with being a servant leader to make sure you're in as good of a place as possible to care for others who matter most to you in your lives. I heard it just yesterday, Clay, that when we put ourselves, when we always put other people first, we train others to put us last. Yeah. Which is a great, just like, what are yeah. we teaching others in the way that we act? And if we never take care of ourselves, we're teaching people that it's okay to put yourself last. And I like to think about... Way this perspective from like individualistic and collectivist cultures, because I think this can, with the proper language, because to me, cultural responsiveness is using the right language and examples that align with people's preferences and values and lived experience. And I do still believe, because many might argue at first glance, this is a byproduct of like American individualistic culture. But if you care, for those, and it is a collectivistic culture where it's beyond me, self-care can be viewed from that lens. And maybe you wanna re remove the, the word self from it, but it is about how well you are in the service of others. Because if we're not well, we're stressed, fatigued, and we're gonna say and do things that are less skillful to others and engage in behaviors that ultimately take us farther away from our values or the things that matter most to us. And a prime example, I'm really stressed at work. I walk home, I get, I open, come home, go through the door. My four-year-old and seven-year-old are there to greet me and they wanna play with me, but I tell them I'm too tired. And because I am tired, I got rotten sleep. I'm stressed and I didn't regulate myself before coming into the house. And I just, they're bid for attention. And I really want to be there to build that relationship. I ignore it and I don't take advantage of it. So I want to talk about it. We developed what's called the Achiever Resilience Curriculum. This was when I was at the University of Washington. We've done three randomized control trials and a, a couple of different studies. So what we tried to do is take different well-being promoting practices under the umbrella of self-care and package them so people can kind of learn about them, understand what they look like, how encourage them to try them out and apply them in their own lives and determine on the back end whether they found benefit and would like to integrate it as part of kind of uh, their lifestyle. Now, many of these educator coping and resilience programs are built on mindfulness-based practices alone. And I just want to point out that mindfulness-based practices can be great. They offer tons of benefit. But if the only route to well-being is mindfulness and people don't like it, they start to give up hope. So that it's like mindfulness, if it works for you, great, because they can be beneficial. But nothing in this model says that you have to do all of them. And so it's more about people learning about and thinking through the motions on what are these well-being promoting practices. And I'm going to focus on a few for the remainder of our time. And really, I'm going to talk about the managing the tense emotions and really therapeutic lifestyle choices, which are cheap, free things that are often more effective than any psychotropic medication that someone can take that represent choices and things we can do as part of 
our lifestyle habits. So I want to talk first about the idea of cognitive fusion. So this is a technical term. Cognitive means kind of thoughts that are going through your head. Fusion means connected or bonded. Thoughts are bonded or connected to what? How someone feels and behaves. Now, cognitive fusion isn't good if we're having unhelpful thoughts, unrealistic thoughts, inaccurate thoughts, because that means if I have unhelpful, inaccurate thoughts, I'm going to feel crummy and it's going to dominate how I behave. Too many people treat thoughts as fact. Thoughts aren't fact. Thoughts are thoughts. I would imagine some of you have had a weird thought before. You didn't just, when you notice it was a weird thought, you didn't just say, me must act out the behavior. You probably labeled it as such. Now, when thoughts are paired with a physiological response, we start to take our thoughts as literal truths and it dominates how we feel and ultimately how we're gonna behave. So as an example, I could make you, we're not even in the same place, but using words, because that's what thoughts are, Thoughts are essentially words and images that we've accrued over time that give us the ability to think. But I can make you secrete saliva in your mouth by imagining I take us all to a, a lemon orchard and the, the lemons are so ripe on the tree and they're just busting. We then each grab a, a, a lemon. We take it back, we wash it off. And through the pores, you can just smell the lemon. And then you get a knife and you cut through that lemon and you squeeze the lemon juice into a cup and you just drink that juice. And all of a sudden, by using words, I can cause you to have a physiological response. I could use words and cause you to cry. I could use words and cause you to feel happy. That's how powerful words are. Now, when those words happen in between your own ears and they have an emotion on the line, they really start to dominate how, what people say and do. And so part of the well-being is really getting better at what we call cognitive diffusion, recognizing thoughts aren't fact. They're just hypotheses to be examined and disproved or repurposed. A thought isn't fact. Just because you're having a thought doesn't mean it's fact. Emotions aren't fact. They're hypotheses. And what we need to do is like, how helpful is this thought? If I keep on and hold tightly onto this and let this thought dominate how I feel and behave, how helpful is this thought to me? How hopeful is this thought? Will this thought enable me to be productive and effective? And if it's not, and we, we start to examine the thought and we're looking at the thought rather from the thought, we can start to repurpose. Now, the heart of cognitive behavior therapy, which there's been over 400 studies, randomized control studies, demonstrating its effectiveness to promote people's mental health, the heart of that methodology is cognitive restructuring. The method of cognitive restructuring is that being more aware of thinking, especially when unwanted, uncomfortable stress or emotions are on the line, begin to examine those thoughts. If they're unhelpful, we repurpose them to be more helpful. Some people call these red thought, green thought exercises. Start to look at your thought. Is that a red thought? A red thought is unhelpful, meaning if you believed it as the truth and let it dominate your behavior, it will interfere with you achieving the goals you have for yourself, and it will lead you to engaging in behaviors that are not aligned with your values. So given that it's an unhelpful thought, what's a more helpful thought? What advice would you give to someone who you love and you want to support if they're coming to you asking you to think about a particular situation? What's a more helpful, hopeful thought to have? Now, the same advice we would give to someone we cared about is the same thoughts we need to take seriously. Because many people are getting bossed around by their thoughts, particularly in all the uncertainty about thinking, well, I can't or I won't be able to do this, or this is going to be so bad about this. And they start to take all those thoughts as literal truths and it starts to activate their emotional response. And then they start feeling overwhelmed and they start to produce a wear and tear because that uh, activated stress response. 
So one part of this is beginning to understand ourselves. Like what, what are my matches? So matches are things that really start to provoke an unwanted pattern of thinking, feeling, and ultimately engaging in unskillful values, incongruent behavior. So you start to say and do things. Imagine in your home, if you have, you're married and you have a partner, those situations where you start to get agitated and you say and do things that ultimately are not aligned with the type of spouse you want to be. And there's always a match and that match starts to get you to have some unhelpful thoughts and you start to take those thoughts seriously. It impacts how you feel and we're more likely to engage in those behaviors. So we got to understand ourselves because we all have matches or I could say we all have buttons. And when those things get, the match gets struck or the button gets pushed, we're likely to have unhelpful thoughts. And there's likely to be uncomfortable feelings that start to motivate us to want to say and do something that is unskillful or values incongruent. So this is the science of behavior. One way to think about this is imagine, I'm going to put this in the context of a class, that I'm going to publicly re reprimand and remove a kid from class. Now, the kid's behavior is the trigger for that reaction. Because I wouldn't just do it out of thin air, there's always a trigger because the fire in this sense is remove, publicly re reprimanding and removing a kid from class. Now I need to be aware of there's certain behaviors that kids do that really want me to reprimand it publicly, even though I know that's not effective and then move too quickly to remove the kid's presence from the class, which harms the relationship and can create situations that are worse for the kid in the long run. Now I'm more likely I call it a setting event, and that's lighter fluid. There's certain days I have lighter fluid on me. Lighter fluid alone doesn't produce the fire, but it increases the probability on those days when my match gets struck, I'm more likely to feel motivated to publicly reprimand and move the kid from the class. And the reason why I do that, because I just want relief. I don't want to deal with it. That's what motivates. So these setting events, are things where we got to wash off our own lighter fluid so we can be more robust in the face of the matches. Then we have to develop techniques to be able to manage ourselves when those matches get struck. How are we going to stay in a regulated state? And we need to know when we're cool, calm, and collected and we're not emotionally reactive, what are the skillful behaviors that I really should stay focused on? Even though my emotions are trying to tell me to do one thing, don't do what your emotions are encouraging you to do. Do that which is effective in the moment. So this is where we help people recognize our ability to regulate ourselves in certain situations can be depleted if we don't take care of ourselves. Now, judges are objective people. We want to trust. And our ability, their ability to make good decisions depends on when <laughs> they had a snack or a break. So their favorable decisions go down as they go longer periods in terms of a break. Basically, they're getting tired and hungry. And their, their ability to make favorable decisions gets depleted as they get tired and hungry. And that's what we call setting events. So we, we need to think about here is where adult self-regulation is. But I need to know what are the situations or triggers that get the best of me that I really need to manage myself. And if you start noticing, when you start thinking about distance learning in the new, new year, you start to have a lot of thoughts and intense feelings, then that's a good situation where you need to you start to begin to use self-regulation strategies. I'm increasing my, my own awareness of self in ways where I can better manage my physiology. Because when my emotions and thoughts start to get ramped up, I really feel motivated to engage in certain behaviors that are not in my best interest, not in the best interest of maybe my colleagues or the students who I care about. So one exercise we have people go through is like identify what is your lighter fluid and what are your matches? From a pet peeve standpoint, my matches are if you publicly whistle, don't do that, it bugs me. And pet peeves are kind of joking. They're, we can understand that maybe that bothers you, but nobody else. But then there's really serious matches. So public whistling and then riding, someone riding their hands on their bike, without riding their bike without their hands on it and trying to act cool. And there's no real function 
why they're doing it. It just, that's a match where I feel like if I'm in my car, kind of, whoa, I'm getting close to knocking you over. Now, how many of you are hangry people? And it's real. Or if you feel you had prior stressors from home and those are carrying forward, you're more likely to be vulnerable when the match gets struck. You can say and do things that are unskillful. So this is one route where we start to get and increase our own self-care and it's through self-awareness and self-regulation of thoughts and feelings. The last piece I want you, because there's a bigger puzzle here, there's a lot of strategies, but because of time, another area is these ideas of therapeutic lifestyle choices that are cheap, readily available, have negative, a few negative side effects. There's a, all kinds of fascinating research where these, a lot of these strategies are more effective than any type of treatment or intervention that you could do. Like, do people actually schedule in relaxation into their lives as if it was as important of, as going to the grocery store? Because you should. People scheduling in recreation to have fun and plug into those types of things. Spending time outdoors. But there's the big two. We don't know what the true prevalence rate for mental health problems are for people in general after controlling for sleep and physical activity problems. Once you get sleep in place and people are physically active, we see so many mental health issues go away. And I look at mental health issues as emotional problems that are chronic and impairing someone's functioning in some way. And so it's not like a stigmatized view. It's just the emotions are getting the best of someone and causing them to engage in certain behaviors that are getting in the, getting in the way of relationships, job performance, self-care. Now, sleep and physical activity. Many people aren't in a physiological place to have the energy and sense of vitality to take on the work. They're not treating sleep as if the quality of their life depended on it, because it does. There's a reason why we spend a third of our lives sleeping. It is virtually connected to everything meaningful. And so when we start to take a self-care uh, stance, we start to fundamentally look at our physical well-being. Do I have the energy and sense of vitality to plug in and do what I need to do? We live in a culture that prides itself on sleep deprivation which is connected to increased probability of Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative diseases, type two diabetes, uh, obesity, early death, you name it, sleep's connected. So we call it the formula for good sleep. First, we have to understand how, what does good sleep mean? Well, I need to get the right amount. And I'll go back here, the right amount. People need eight hours, even if they don't think they do, they need it because people just develop habits where we, they can go with less but it is producing wear and tear on them. Quality sleep means uninterrupted sleep. So not only are you in bed for eight hours and you can get the eight hours, but was it interrupted? Because if you have interrupted sleep, you don't go through what we call the waves of sleep. And people need to go through four cycles of, and get through what's called deep sleep four times to have that rest, restorative sleep where you wake up and you feel like you can take on the day. You look into the mirror and you're like, wow, I'm looking at like a lot, way more attractive version of myself versus days where you're, you haven't got good rest. And then consistent sleep is really this idea of your circadian rhythm, not messing with that. You have a body clock and it needs to get in sync. And if you don't have consistent bedtime and week times across the weekdays and weekdays to weekend, you're basically like what you're doing to your body is hopping in a jet from California and flying to New York on the weekends. And that's why your body feels crummy. Now, what happens is your immune system goes down, you're moodier, you're groggier, your cognitive intake and output starts to all get compromised. So the methods we say are the reset, and I know we're coming up to time here, is the reset model. Routines, environment, St managing stress and emotions at bedtime through self-regulation and technology. And so what we try to do is help people identify things associated with the reset model that represent ways they can improve their sleep to get better, uh, uh, better sleep, how they can improve their sleep environment, 
in order to have things that are less disrupting and help falling and staying asleep, better manage stress and emotions that come to the forefront when you go to lay down at night in terms of to-do lists, obligations, things that you're worrying about, and then getting a better handle on technology at bedtime. We think young people are rotten. The adults, the data indicate, are worse around bedtime with their technology in some ways uh, than young people. So being able to manage technology so it doesn't interfere with the ability to fall and stay asleep well. So when we come back to this, and I'll just leave you with this, there's two pieces to this puzzle. The self-care movement without attention to the environment is lopsided and uh, improperly focused. It really is about bringing an attention to creating healthy working conditions for the adults and supporting the staff to acquire and apply certain well-being promoting practices that enable them to be able to manage their thoughts, physiological stress responses, and their behaviors as they plug in to a meaningful career, but one that does have stress and adversity that comes along with it. So I'll just leave that if there's any reflections, questions, comments. So much good stuff, Clay, as always. Um, I know we're at our time, but I wanna share my screen just for a second here uh, to share with folks. I know uh, much of what you shared today is, is in many ways a distillation of a lot of other things that you talk about very effectively. Uh, and you can find all of this content and a whole lot more in our on-demand professional development. Actually, back in March, we had uh, this realization that uh, educators in schools were going to need more bite-sized uh, professional development that could be used uh, asynchronously. People could go at their own pace. People could pick and choose. As you mentioned before, we're talking about relevant PD. People could choose the things that feel relevant to them and their role. Um, as opposed to the one size fits all sort of model. And so you'll see here, our on-demand PD has all kinds of good stuff, including conversations on our character strong culture, the way we think about that. But uh, there's a whole unit on stress coping and resilience where you break down each of these things uh, into more bite-sized pieces. So all of these are 20 to 30 minutes long in of themselves and uh, has guided notes attached to it. Um, so educators or schools could sort of help people track their progress but some other things you alluded to, we're talking student behavior, I'm thinking functionally about behavior, one of my favorite units. You alluded to it briefly, those matches uh, and the lighter fluid uh, metaphor that I think is so good to have empathy in the way we approach it. The establish, maintain, restore methodology, responding with empathy, which is the prompt method um, to respond to behavior, hospitable soil, MTSS. Um, we have all kinds of goodies in here. So if you're interested in that, uh, we're gonna drop um, a link to how to learn more about that. We have schools individually who are using that. We have districts who are using that. Um, and we got a lot of voices in there, but um, Dr. Cook has some awesome, awesome stuff in there if you're interested. That said, um, maybe we just spend a moment. There's a couple of questions um, in here, Clay, that we could maybe chat through for even just a second. Um, I would be curious to know if there's any types of tools or assessments, tangibles, regarding psychological safety of an environment. I know in our district, we have a really good sense of things as a school counselor, but feel like I could get pushback from some leadership. It'd be interesting to have some tangible data of sorts. Not sure if that makes sense. That was the question. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, there's validated measures, brief measures of psychological safety. You essentially like it's uh, 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 similar to a, a climate measure where you're getting people's perceptions and then you aggregate up and you re represent it as a characteristic of the school, like where are we at as a group? in terms of our psychological safety and there are, and I'm happy to uh, relay those through um, others so you can access that. We've also developed and validated, it's called the teacher subjective well-being questionnaire. And one of the dimensions of our teacher subjective well-being questionnaire that we validated, uh, Tyler Renshaw, who's a professor at Utah State University and I developed it, is a sense of belonging and connection with one of the elements being whether people feel a sense of trust and being able to speak um, mistakes and faults in the presence mm -hmm. of others or whether they hide all those things. Which leads nicely to this next question, which is any suggestions for staff who have no problem admitting fallibility, but still continue to not meet deadlines or take on too much? Yeah, I mean, that's where 
you take like PLC where you have this awesome potential hub for protected time for people that admit mistakes and do, but there's no structure or protocol with deliverables. And so when you get people together to identify what's not working, you have to give them a process to begin to plan what they're going to do differently uh, from within the next interval of time. If you had a, like a monthly PLC. So if you don't have structure and process that you wrap around, that's where adults can turn it that that problem solving time turns into admiring the problem and not solving it. And so you mm -hmm. need structure and process when you get people to convene. And that's some of the norms and methods we give people as we, within the context of psychological safety that lead to productivity. I love this next question, which is taking sort of like that PLC approach and even that higher level, like psychological safety approach to the ground level of the classroom. Ryan, just said, um, how do you uh, use this information in designing instruction? How can I integrate this into learning? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think about the workflow. Like I have, what is the time I spend with students? And what am I gonna be intentional about doing? What can I do at the very outset of my first interactions with students to cause them one, to feel connected with me and help them transition in? They're moving into my environment where we've, co-created certain expectations on how the time spent together is going to go well and then what can i do to connect them with one another as a group to you know build that sense of community in class as a lead-in to some of the 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 work and then there's going to be teachable moments that pop up where we can actually debrief and reflect and bring uh, elevate certain things that have happened and how they could maybe get in the way or there are really good examples of creating a healthy context for everybody to get the most out of the time spent together. Yeah, I know you dig into a lot of that stuff in some of those, those units and modules and the on demand, but um, and even just on the high level talking about what you talked about today, role modeling, fallibility and humility, right, as we instruct. <laughs> right. In fact, sometimes even planting some of those seeds to allow ourselves to be corrected publicly and role model what failure can look like and how to recover from it and how it's okay. Um, creating those habits. We know consistency is a huge piece of a nurturing environment. So what are we doing on a consistent basis to start or end class? And no matter your content area, building in moments of group and self-care and accountability can be really practical ways to weave some of these high-level concepts in. And then some of them are more behind the scenes, right? The prompt method or responding to behavior empathetically is more sort of integrated into your pedagogy and, and into your practice of how you handle and navigate some of those circumstances. Um, final uh, question here, um, and this one's relevant as we're heading into virtual learning. What suggestions do you have for students who stay up all night gaming and then come to school to fall asleep? Yeah, we are developing a middle school a healthy sleep curriculum, and then we're going to downward extend it and upward extend it to high school because sleep, the average middle schooler, or more than the average, the vast majority of middle schoolers are chronically sleep deprived. And, it, and we don't know what their mental health issues are. So what we do, we've been trying to engage them to understand how sleep is in, so important. And we actually teach it as a skill to be learned. Sleep hygiene is a knowledge base and a skill set that can be taught. And then what we do is we create dream teams. And those dream teams are kids who collaborate together on, you know, creating up with plans and following through with certain plans to get better sleep as a result of that. But the gaming piece, uh, kids start to need to understand that they can function even more better from a dexterity and a problem solving manner when you get better sleep. So turning it off a little bit earlier and getting that additional 20 to 30 minutes of rest will enable them to game even more effectively. And so we <laughs> help kids start to recognize that getting better sleep is actually getting better at gaming too. My, how the tables have turned. I like that. That's, that is uh, awesome. And people are super excited about the fact that you're developing some of those. People are saying sleep hygiene, which I love that that's a good paradigm shift, right? It's not a, uh, a one-off experience. Sleep hygiene, meaning what are we doing over time? And we know the old uh, myths have been busted that you can't quote unquote catch up on sleep super effectively, that it is an ongoing hygienic practice, much like flossing or uh, showering <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> right. So to clarify that concept, and I think you have a whole, a whole module on sleep uh, in that on demand. 
uh, PD, which is pretty awesome and necessary and super cool to hear that that's coming uh, downwards towards middle school or someone else was asking, could we bring um, folks like our students to listen to some of the modules presented by Clay in that on demand or what we're building with Aaron Jones around equity? I think absolutely. I think any time that you're being exposed to something as an adult and you feel like you can offer that to students uh, as they're ready for it, absolutely. And so many of those units in that on-demand PD, Clay, I think are relevant to young people. They can, you know, in the context and well-led by a teacher, you can take all that stuff on stress coping and resilience and turn it right around for yeah, you can be humble and admit fallibility because that's what our, our sleep curriculum is joining with students to say, look around in your life. So adults aren't that good at this either. So we're going to learn yeah. together. We're going to plan together and we're going to try to improve so yeah. we can be the best possible versions of ourselves and achieve the types of meaningful things we want. And so when you align and join with students and learn together and not try to say we got this figured out on the coping and resilience piece or the sleep piece. <laughs> You know, students start to see and respect us more, yeah. and then we join them and collaborate with them on coming up with plans to for every person to improve, the adults and the students together. I love that idea. Well asked, Karen. Ryan, to close it out, says, it all seems to around, orbit around identity work, values, character, living with integrity. These are big questions, big work. Couldn't agree more, Ryan. And uh, I'm super grateful for people like Dr. Cook who are thinking about those big questions helping informing the way we do that big work through that research type lens uh, and lots more tools to provide, lots more stuff uh, available to you. And I uh, can't wait for the next one of these, Clay, and good to see you. Yeah, nice seeing you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right, everyone, have a beautiful day. Talk to you very soon.